whoever finishes the coffee pot, please empty out the glass. Did you see my note? Mike. He wrote me a note. That's the nicest guy ever. I couldn't have asked for a better roommate. What up, dude? Don't what up, dude me. What up, dude you? Did I get coffee this morning? He's just so thoughtful. Okay, so you got coffee. You know. You got, you literally had to move the note to get the pot out. Wow, he really wants me to read this note. What, what did it, how could you not read the note? It's like eight words. This guy, just tell me what it says. I already wrote it. I wrote the thing. I'm not gonna write it again on the text message. I already wrote it on the note. He is so intentional with his communication. I can't, I can't. <laughs> this is, is that, am I reading that right? Yeah. I hope I can be as good of a roommate as him one day. Well, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I couldn't see it anyway, but I wonder how many of you would have to say, I've got a relationship just like that. I've got a relationship that could be characterized by bad blood. Maybe it's a co-worker, maybe it's a family member that you no longer speak to, and as the holidays get near, you plan for ways to avoid that person. Maybe it's a former friend, and perhaps you don't even know the reasons why, but somehow there's some bad blood that has crept into the relationship. The first fill in the blank on your message outline is certainly true of life. Bad blood can infect any relationship, and it can happen at any time. In fact, there may be times where you can't even pinpoint exactly when it happened or was there a certain incident that triggered it. This series is not just for estranged relationships that have kind of almost like a saga type of stories that go along with it. It's also just for hard relationships. Relationships where there's been a little, bitty, a little bit of bad blood that seeped in and they're just tough relationships. The truth is this. All of us have it. None of us want it and no relationships are immune from it. Here's what also is true. All relationships have moments when they have to be guided back to a good place. And how we handle those difficult moments, those times where there's some bad blood that's influencing the relationship, they influence the quality of our very lives. I heard someone put it this way. The quality of our lives is only as good as the quality of our relationships. And I think intuitively every one of us would agree this is absolutely true. The unfortunate part of bad blood, the worst part about bad blood is this. It makes our lives worse. It brings into our life pain and anger and hurt. And the energy that we spend on these bad blood relationships, it takes away and it literally robs us of the quality of life that we so want to have. There's tension in the relationship and here's what happens. The lack of peace in any relationship will ultimately rob you of peace in your own life. But here's the good news, that peace in relationships is possible. And that's what we want. We want peace. We want to be happy. But where does happiness come from? Look at this next fill in. Happiness comes when you have peace with God, with yourself, and with others. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about these next few weeks together. But there's a key truth that you have to understand from the very get-go. For some of you, this will be the most freeing thing you will hear during this entire series. Here it is. 
you can have peace about the relationship without having peace in the relationship. Let's repeat that. Look at it again. You can have peace about the relationship even without peace in the relationship. And again, some of you personally know this because you've experienced this. You've gone through this. You can have a relationship that's characterized by bad blood, but you can have peace about that relationship even if there's no peace in the relationship itself. And ultimately, that's going to lead to greater joy and happiness in your own life. There's a tension, but there's also a truth. And we know this. Scripture tells us that the truth will set us free. Paul, the great missionary, wrote about half of our New Testament. He was a very passionate man, passionate about his relationship with God, passionate about relationships he had. He was very educated. In fact, in our own terminology, today we would probably say he was trained to be an attorney. And in a letter he wrote to the first century Christians in the ancient city of Rome, in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, he gives us some fantastic insight into relationships with bad blood. He says this to us. He says, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. And if you just look at that and you just see that, you go, that's a lot easier said than done. In fact, you may think, I bet Paul didn't have in-laws. I bet Paul never had a roommate. I bet he never had a, you know, an annoying co-worker. We can look at that and just say, that's kind of just like pie-in-the-sky type of stuff. You would sit there and say, it's a lot, lot easier to say it than to actually do it. But if you and I knew the bad blood Paul had in his life, these words would have even a greater impact on your life than maybe they do even now. Paul was up to his eyeballs, if you would, in bad blood. In his former life, he literally came and he persecuted Christians, arrested them, even was responsible for some of their very deaths on that. And then his life had a 180, a really, just a complete turn in life, totally flipped. He came from being a church hater to a pioneer in the early church. As a result of that, he had enemies kind of on both sides of the coin, both in his former life and in his present life as well. And Paul adds a couple of phrases to this verse. Let's look at the first one. He says this, If it is possible, if it's possible, live at peace with everyone. We all know there's kind of two sides to every relationship. So maybe you're in a relationship where you said, I've honestly tried. I've given it my very best effort, but it hasn't gone well. There really is no peace. If I knew something different to try, I would actually do it. But on the other hand, maybe there's some relationships you have or relationships you've heard about where someone said, I never thought we would have a good relationship. Never in a million years, but here we are. And we have a relationship that's healthy and characterized by kindness and by love. What Paul is trying to get us to understand is this. The good news is these healthy relationships may be possible, but here's the bad news. It might never be possible. Paul's saying, we just don't know. We don't know how it's going to work out, whether it will or whether it won't. But if you've done all that you know to do, as far as it depends on you, is a very powerful and incredibly powerful phrase. And that's how he terms or finishes out this this verse in verse 18 he says if it is possible as far as it depends on you live at peace with everyone next fill in the blank goes like this in a relationship that's characterized by bad blood let me ask you this where does most of your energy go to where does it channeled if you would and it goes to the person that you are have the bad blood relationship with And you constantly use the word if. If he or she would just change, if she would just stop, if he would just get over himself, if he would quit being so selfish, if she would just repay me, then we could have a relationship. When Paul says it's possible as far as it depends on you, here's what he's telling us to do. Stop talking about them and start talking about you. What can I do about this? What depends on you in the relationship? Before you worry about them, what Paul wants us to see, you've got to figure out and you've got to own what depends upon you. 
Maybe some of you parents can remember a time where your children were younger and you're walking through your house, you're really not paying attention to where you're walking. Maybe you've got something in your hand to drink. Maybe you, you've got a, a newspaper you're reading. And all of a sudden, you step on something. You're barefooted and you step on something very sharp and pointed, brings some pain into your life, and you quickly realize it's the toys of your children that have not been picked up. And you just lose it. I mean, you just start yelling, who did this? Who's responsible for this? Get down here right now and pick up these toys. And they get down there and they're scurrying around. And you say, no, go back to your room. Get, go back to your room type of thing. And the whole time your spouse is sitting there going, you're going to regret this. I think you're going to regret it. And a few days later, you hear your children arguing with one another. Some, one of the two has knocked something over. And as the argument begins to escalate, all of a sudden you step in and you say, hey, how did this happen? I mean, just a few minutes ago, everything was fine. Somebody knocked something over. Now you're yelling at each other. Why? And only as the honesty of a young child can do. They look at you with their sweet, innocent face and they say, well, Daddy, we were just doing what we saw you doing the other day. And you want to say to your child, don't bring that up. That is so last week. We are over that. But here's what the truth of the matter is this. You and I have to understand this. In our pie, we have to own our slice. We have to own our slice of the pie. No matter how big it may be, no matter how small it may be. In that situation, that dad would need to say this, okay, this slice depends on me. Maybe he needs to say to his children, you know, you're right. I displayed that behavior, and now you're mimicking my behavior. You know what? You're right. I shouldn't have said that, but yes, I did it. This depends on me. Again, it may be small, it may be big, but what depends upon you, you and I must own. Paul goes on and he says this, as far as, as far as means there is a distance to this. So a question that we want to ask is this, you may think you've gone as far as you can possibly go, but can you go any further? Can you take one more step? Now, I don't know about you, but if you heard the message last week, you heard me say that I, I hated that message because it was so personal to me. I want you to know this. I already dislike this message series. It's really hitting too close to home. And I think it's therapeutic. Maybe would you would say that with me. Would you just affirm all right now, even though I can't hear you, just say it with me. I don't like this message series because, again, it hits too close to home. And, you know, sometimes I wonder, who chooses these series anyway? I mean, who does this? What? Oh, I do? Oh, well, that was really a stupid decision I made, I guess, down the road on that. Maybe there is no relationship now, but are you open to the idea that there might be something else that you can do to take a step further in the relationship? Some of you may be thinking this, and it's a great thing to think. <laughs> when is enough enough? Is there ever a time when it's irresponsible for me to go any further in the relationship and you may be very surprised at the answer. The answer is, you know what? There really is a time when that's exactly true. We're going to be talking about it. That's why I hope in these next few weeks you'll come back so you'll hear the answer to that. We're going to talk about this idea that not only is it appropriate for me to stop, but there's times when the responsible thing for me to do is to actually say enough is enough. But until then, is there another step that you can take forward? Are you willing to take one more step? Here's the reason why we need to consider that. Because peace is possible for you when you've done all you can do. And I think every one of us would agree with this. I want to do all I can do. So even if there's never peace in the relationship, I want to be able to have peace about the relationship. I want to be able to look myself in the mirror. I want to be able to go to my life group, and I want them, as they've been maybe praying for me in this situation, for them to hear me and to say, you know what, I think you're right. I think you've gone as far as you can go. Paul says, if it's as possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. I want to give you one step that I'm asking you to take today. It is an incredibly powerful step. And to explain it, I want to use an illustration taken from the game of golf. Now, some of you 
probably or say, I know really nothing about golf. I think you probably know enough to know what I'm going to do in this illustration, what I'm talking about. In the game of golf, you have seen, no doubt, maybe it's Tiger Wood, maybe it's Phil Mickelson, one of the newer pros on the tour, whatever. Whenever they go to putt a ball, before they do that, what do they do? In fact, I actually have a picture to show you, first of all. Here's exactly what they do. They get behind the ball, perhaps their caddies with them. They get behind that ball, and they begin to look, and they begin to, you're thinking, what are they looking at? What they're looking at is the line they need to putt the ball in order to make it try to go in the hole. When they're trying to look at that line, very few greens are totally flat. There's contour in the green. It may slope one way, the other way. If they hit the ball straight at the hole, it's going to veer off to one side or another. They won't make their putt. So they're looking to try to line up their putt. Once they do that, they do something else. I have another picture to show you that illustrates it. Here's what they do. They go to the other side of the ball. They take the long walk on the other side of the ball, and then they get on the other side, and then they look at it from this angle. They look at it from the other side. You say, why on earth would they do that? Because they're looking to see if there's something they wouldn't notice from the other side. But by looking at it from this side, they see something. Oh, it could affect how they actually line up their putt. Now, in the game of golf, once those pros have done that, and some of us maybe are not pros. In fact, most of us are. But my guess is you've probably imitated those pros. You've tried to line up your ball. You've gone behind it and back and forth and that type of thing. Here's what happens next. Notice the fill in the blank. As a golfer looks at their putt from the other side, here's why they do it. Because he or she might see something from that side that will change the way he or she approaches that putt. Now, after they've done all that, we've done all that, here's what happens. We putt, and guess what? We still miss it most of the time, don't we? We still miss it. Most golfers will tell you, though, that they see most of the breaks from their side instead of walking on the other side. They see it from this side. They see most of the breaks. But here's what they know. It's the next fill in the blank. Every once in a while, when you walk over to the other side, you see something that changes everything. In golf, it changes how you line up and how you hit that golf ball. This same principle is true in relationships. And when you and I take the time to walk on the other side and try to see the other side's perspective, there's a name for that in a relationship. And the name we give it is the word empathy. Empathy. You may have a good relationship, but something happens and suddenly there's some bad blood. Things get complicated. Maybe you're not talking anymore. Maybe you're really not connected. Maybe your relationship kind of looks like this relationship here. Lovely couple right there. This reminds me of a story that I heard of a, a man and his wife, an older couple that visited Jerusalem. And while they were visiting Jerusalem, unfortunately, tragically, the wife passed away. A local funeral director in Jerusalem was talking to the, the husband about his wife's passing. And he said, sir, you, you have a couple of options. If you want, you can have your wife buried here in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land. It will cost you $150. On the other hand, he said, if you want us to ship your wife back to the States, it's going to cost you $5,000. The man very quickly looked at the funeral director and he says, I want you to send my wife's body back to the United States. And the funeral director was a little puzzled. He said, I, I really don't understand why you would do that. I mean, it would be a wonderful thing to be buried in the Holy Land. It's only $150 versus $5,000 if we sent her back to the United States. And the man simply said this, Long ago, a man here died and he was buried here. And three days later, he rose from the dead. I simply can't take that chance. Send her back to the U.S. That was a relationship that obviously had some bad blood in it. Here's the next fill in the blank. Empathy is, central, is the central tool in regards to creating healthy relationships. Teresa Wiseman, who is a researcher, a nursing scholar, has written the four steps in empathy. We're going to quickly run through those. I think they can be very helpful to you. Here's the first step. Take on the other person's perspective realizing this, this is their truth. This is their truth. This is the idea that you walk around 
and you look at that relationship just like that golfer looks at that putt. You look at it from a different, completely different angle from the other side. Maybe you'll get a different perspective if you do that. Now, this is not sympathy. Sympathy is acknowledging what the other person feels. You look at them and you say, I, I can just tell by your face, I know you're hurting. I can see that you're in a lot of pain emotionally or physically type of thing. Empathy, on the other hand, is feeling what the other person feels. It is feeling what the other person feels. And the only way to do this is to take that long walk and to look at the relationship from the other person's perspective. It's the only way to gain empathy. We need to understand this, though, as we talk about empathy. If we can go back one very quickly. Whoever you have bad blood with, whatever they're doing, please understand this. It makes total sense to them. That's why we said it is truth to them. They believe they're doing the right thing. They think that, and it makes total sense. It doesn't make sense to you, but it makes sense to them. And it will never make sense to you unless you and I walk around to their side and we might gain some new insight into why they're doing what they're doing in their relationship with you. We have to take that walk to the other side. So that's the first principle. Here's the second principle. Suspend your judgment. Suspend your judgment. In other words, I know what I feel. And I'm not certainly not going to say my feelings aren't valid. I'm not going to say what they did is okay. But I am going to suspend my judgment for now because I want to have the opportunity to try to see things from their perspective, to look at it from the other side. Please understand when you do this, you don't have to excuse what he or she did. That's not what we're talking about right now. Empathy, though, will at least help you make some sense out of what they're doing. You may have one of those aha moments when you kind of get a little background, a little more understanding. You go, well, now I understand why they did what they did. You still probably won't agree with it. You don't like it. But at least it gives you a little more understanding on that. And then the third step is this. You recognize the other person's emotion. You recognize their emotion. This is the hardest of the four steps by far in a way. You're trying to understand what he or she is feeling in the relationship. And then here's the fourth step that we're encouraged to take. We need to communicate that emotion. We need to articulate that emotion either to the person, either to a trusted friend, maybe even writing it down. And the reason this is so important, anytime you begin to try to communicate that to someone else, it helps you to clarify the issues that you're dealing with. Empathy truly is and can be the key to opening up a dialogue that leads to a healthy relationship. It's the idea of saying, hey, I need to hear your whole story. I need to understand what you're feeling. I need to put myself in your shoes. I recently read this. Band-aids don't fix bullet holes, but continuing to approach the bad blood from only your side won't help either. I think that's certainly true. Look at this next fill in. As long as you continue to only look at the relationship from your side, you're going to continue to reaffirm what you already know and what you already feel. If you want peace in that relationship, if you want peace about the relationship as well, then you must walk on their side to gain their perspective. Empathy truly is first aid for bad blood for whatever bad blood may be in your life. And here's what happens when you and I walk around and we see from their perspective, we see the relationship from their side, if you would. Here's some things that can happen. You see things you would not have seen, just like the golfer may see a break in the green he didn't see by looking from only his side. Your anger can be moved to compassion. When you empathize and you begin to understand where they're coming from, your anger may move to, well, I actually have compassion. I didn't know that about what they were dealing with. And then also, your hurt can begin to heal. It may lead to even a better relationship, or maybe it just might lead to at least having a relationship. But most important of all is to understand this, that when you and I choose to make the long walk of empathy, you and I are mirroring what God did for you. Jesus is the ultimate display of empathy on God's part. God, instead of sending a cloud to communicate, or a tablet written on stone, or a bush that catches fire, God came in person. 
God came in person. Jesus moved first. That's the good news. So God simply asked us to do this. He asked us to love as he has loved us. He asked us to forgive as he has forgiven us. And he asked us to show mercy as I have been shown mercy from God himself. And there is no way, no way you and I can do this unless we run into a Savior who has done this very thing for us. And if he, if you and I do what he asks us to do, notice this last fill in, your life will be better. Your life will be better, not just because you feel better, but because you and I will be reflecting the image of God in you. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He wants to bring peace into your life and into your relationships. If you look at the bottom of your outline, I'm asking you to consider two things today. Maybe as a result of our time together, you will say this, I'll review the four steps of empathy, and I will ask God to help me implement them in my life. Or maybe the second one, I'm asking God to empower me to love, forgive, and show mercy to others, just as he's shown mercy to me. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the empathy that you have shown to us, that Jesus came to this earth to be one, of my, one among us, he showed us how to live, but we thank you, Father, that he lived that perfect sinless life that enabled him to repair a broken relationship with you. Father, help us to be willing to show empathy. Help us to be willing to walk on the other side, their side, and try to see the bad blood from their perspective. And as we do that, would you honor that? Would you give us greater insight in, in, into the relationship to what they're feeling? May that strike perhaps compassion in us. May it help bring healing to that relationship. May it enable us to be able to work past that bad blood to make the relationship prayerfully stronger and better than it's ever been before. Help us to do this as only you can. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.